First thing I'm going to do is show a, just a short four minute video with some, some construction photos and then a, uh, a time lapse that's taken from Reunion Tower where you can see the entire project as it's built over the four year period it took to build it. So I'll start out with, I may start out with that. So hopefully that gives you kind of a, an overview of the scale of the project. Uh, the Horseshoe was a $798 million design build project, uh, re reconstructing the existing interchange between 30 and 35E, just kind of south into the west of downtown. 
Uh, some of the key features, uh, one of the main things we had to do was replace the bridges across the Trinity River on both I-30 and I-35E. Uh, on the 35E leg, the northbound structure is actually the old Cadiz Street Viaduct structure built back in the 1930s when the levees were built. Uh, but all of those structures on 30 and 35E were both uh, deteriorated and in desperate need of replacement. Uh, we also constructed the Calatrava uh, steel arches uh, over the Trinity on the 30 leg. Um, and then we reconstructed the 30 and 35E interchanges, uh, kind of an unusual geometry, so you, you get kind of two uh, interchanges. Uh, so talking about what's going on on the 35E leg, if you look at our typical sections before, you had four lanes in each direction and a single lane reversible HOV. And then if you look at the bottom, this is what we built and we kind of superimposed the existing over the top of that just so you can see how much larger uh, the footprint uh, that we were able to accomplish. Um, went to a two lane reversible HOV. Uh, we also added collector distributors across the river, so increased capacity quite a bit over what was existing. The top left is the before picture, and bottom right is the after. You can see we, we added quite a lot of bridge across the river. So the next section we're going to look at is down in the, the mix master. This is right around the Houston-Jefferson area. So a typical section looked like this before, where you had some frontage road lanes, you had uh, some GP lanes for I-30, 35. Uh, well, you see we got considerably wider with our, our new footprint, uh, adding the collector distributors in there that did not exist. Uh, we also have the two lane HOV. But on the left is the before, and on the right is after. So you can see we had a lot more pavement. We had to weave all of those lanes underneath the uh, Houston Street Viaduct Bridge. That was a historic structure, so we couldn't touch it. So that was quite the trick, making everything fit. And finally, I'll talk about the 30 leg. So this is probably the biggest change. we. Went from a single structure that uh, held three lanes each direction. And on the bottom, you can see what we have constructed. We've got the Margaret McDermott pedestrian and bicycle bridges, arch about 275 feet tall. Uh, we've got accommodation for a future HOV, and we also had continuous frontage roads across the river. Uh, on 30, which were not there before. So on the left is the before, on the right is the after. Obviously, we made uh, a big improvement to the traffic traveling across uh, I-30 across the river. So a little bit more about the Margaret McDermott Bridge. Uh, uh, it's the city of Dallas. It's a signature pedestrian and bicycle bridge for them, designed by Santiago Calatrava and Hewitt Zollers. Uh, the span is uh, 1,125 feet. Arch height, that's 334 feet above the floodplain. Uh, 31 foot wide, uh, it had over 21,000 feet of suspension cable. There's some pictures from the construction. We had, I believe it was 16 batter drilled shafts on a 10 to 15 degree batter that we installed. That top center picture, you can see the, the device that we had to use to, to install those. That was something very unique. It had never been done, uh, to my knowledge, on a tech stop project. Uh, then there was a footing underneath each one of those. It was about uh, 30 foot by 40 foot by 8 to 10 foot thick. Um, 
And you can see the, the blue uh, formwork uh, that was all custom manufactured out of Kansas. Um, we took those and uh, those were used at each of the four corners of the bridge. So we reused that form four times. So a little bit about the numbers. Some of these are, are pretty staggering. Um, 97, over 97,000 linear feet of drill shaft from 18 to 84 inch diameter. Add all that together, it's over three times the height of Mount, Mount Everest. All in the ground where you can't see it. So, you know, when we're in those early phases of construction, it doesn't seem like a lot's going on. Well, most of it's going into the ground. 65,000 cubic yards of concrete to be exact in the ground. Um, columns and caps, 913 columns on this project, it's predominantly a bridge project, so a lot of big bridge numbers on this job. Over 27,000 cubic yards of column concrete, 457 bent caps for over 35,000 cubic yards of cap concrete. We had over 340,000 linear feet of precast concrete beams. This project used concrete beams exclusively. There's no steel on this project. It's an innovation that our contractor brought to us, uh, saving money, uh, also saving future maintenance. So 64.4 miles of beams, which basically would set in the end, would stretch across the Metroplex. Over 3 million square foot of bridge deck which is equivalent to 52 and a half football fields. Like I said, this is a, this is a bridge job, and there was a lot of bridge. Uh, 82,000 cubic yards of bridge deck concrete. Uh, not as much on the roadway, uh, line period subgrade, uh, only 327,000 square yards or 82-52 tons and then cement treated base that we used on the job is about 334,000 square yards or 117,000 tons. Uh, the analogy is that would uh, fill a football field about 26 feet high. On the concrete paving 312,000 square yards or 40 lane miles of paving 101 cubic yards enough to fill a football field 47 and a half feet high. Uh, we had lots of MSC walls on this job, about 320,000 square feet of them. Uh, on drainage, uh, 40, uh, 47,706 linear feet, sizes from 24 inch to 72 inch. We also had box culverts, almost 4,000 linear feet of those ranging from 9x5s to 10 by 10s um, Not only was this project successful and then we got it built, um, but we also did it safely. So we took a, uh, a baseline of about a three-year average of the accidents in that area uh, prior to the project, and the accident rate actually went down during construction. Uh, so it was done safely. It was also done safely on the part of the contractor. This is some of the contractor's internal numbers and awards. 14, 15, they had over a million consecutive work hours with no recordables. 15, 16, they bumped that to 1.4 million. Um, overall, for the job, 5.2 million man hours of labor went into this job. So they've gotten a couple recognitions. The zero incidents, five start status for one million work hours, and their own corporate award of health, safety, and environmental excellence in 15. So substantial completion of segment A, which is basically the entire project minus the, uh, the signature bridge, that was completed April 23rd. Uh, we're still working. A uh, little bit of change order work we've got to finish up. If you've seen what's going on in the canyon, that's that's what that's about. Uh, about project management and how we were able to deliver a uh, successful project. This was a design build project, and uh, 
these projects get a little complicated and there's lots of people involved. Um, it's easy to have tons of meetings. Uh, but there's an organized approach and this this chart shows how we how we organized that and um, had meetings that made sense. They established a timeline for them, when they would be had, who were the appropriate people to be involved, and uh, we didn't just meet to meet, we met to be productive. Um, the project was driven by construction. So as an owner, <coughs> We were very involved in the in the project and had had ownership, so we were very active in the technical work groups. Um, there was always somebody from TxDOT and from the contractor decision maker that was available to answer a question, make a call, and keep the job moving. I think that was a huge part of our success. Uh, also on the project management side, uh, we had a proactive allocation of risk and active risk management. So some examples, Encore transmission lines. Uh, we had transmission lines crossing on both east and west levees on both the 30 and 35 e legs. So we have four transmission line crossings. Uh, we knew that was going to be a long lead item because we had to buy new poles. Uh, so we went ahead, TxDOT, we went ahead and pursued that relocation ahead of the design-build contract. Uh, similar with the 408 permit to work within the levees, uh, TxDOT pursued that 408 as far as we could uh, until our design-build contractor was able to come on and, and finish out that work. We had significant coordination with the city of Dallas. I also went through one of our wettest years on record. If you notice through the, um, the time lapse, there's a big chunk of time where there's water all in the levees. Uh, so that kind of uh, hampered the, uh, the original sequence that the contractor planned to use. But they, they were innovative, uh, they resequenced their work, and they were able to keep on schedule. Um, and in traffic management, I think we were very effective. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. So we had a bank balance of $2.4 million. Um, we had a schedule of values for lane rentals. So each, each time the contractor wanted to close a lane or multiple lanes, we had a dollar figure associated with that. And as long as they kept that closed, we charged them. And as long as they didn't go over the bank balance of this $2.4 million, they didn't get charged any money. But once they, um, they exceeded the $2.4 million, then it became real money. They had to pay it out of their pocket. So what were the results of these? So most of the lane closures were completed overnight. Uh, very few single lane closures during the day on the weekend. Uh, all full closures were completed in overnight hours and mostly on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, no full closures were needed during the day on the weekend, so we did all our full closures at night. Um, and work during closures was maximized, and I'll, I'll show a slide on that. Um, we didn't have any single lane closures that were picked up in the peak hour, time period A is what we called that. Um, Anything that extended in the peak hour, we considered a liquidated damage. And that did not come out of the bank balance. That was money due directly to TxDOT immediately. Uh, but our contractor worked very well with us. In fact, they started picking up an hour earlier than they normally would just to make sure that they didn't run into the peak hour and get hit with LDs because that's a very significant uh, thing that goes on a contractor's record. <laughs> Um, so overall, we think this was a tremendous benefit to the traffic. Um, talking about multiple activities and optimizing the closures by using these lane rental fees, uh, this is an example of, of one night's work where they did multiple things with one closure. So they set beams in the first two locations, 
Uh, they removed some overhang brackets from a bridge. They also uh, set some temporary shoring towers. All, all four of these things at once under one closure instead of a single closure for each activity. If you look at the bottom picture, this is what that looks like. When you got people working in a lot of different areas overnight, it gets pretty busy, but they did it safely. So I think one of the big successes is that we were collaborative and worked with our contractor. We didn't have a single issue that escalated above the, the project level. I left the project about halfway through. I was project manager, and then I left and uh, uh, to come to my current position. But after I left that project, no issues ever left the project and came up to my level. So we had a really good relationship with the contractor and were able to handle things at that level. Uh, and it was a really collaborative team approach. We, we really worked together, not as TxDOT and PLC, but as one, one team. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd be glad to take any questions.